conversation together, and I was um, honored to be invited to his house uh, for a uh, meeting and uh, uh, snacks and things. And uh, I walked in, and it was like walking into a museum. There was all, all this stuff, only about 10 times more of it. My first uh, impulse was to ask his wife, who does all this thing? <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it, he led us through a, a perfectly wonderful uh, um, mini tour of this uh, house museum that he has of all this Civil War memor memorabilia. And so uh, when uh, we were casting around for a history of medicine speaker, uh, my mind actually um, uh, went to uh, Pete. Uh, you've heard his affiliations and what he does. Uh, he's uh, also written fairly extensively on the history of uh, medicine and uh, dentistry in particular, particularly on the history of um, uh, uh, dental um, anesthesia, which of course is also the history of regular anesthesia because uh, the uh, dentistry was heavily involved in the uh, uh, development of anesthesia. And uh, more recently he's written about the history of the use of x-ray in uh, dentistry. So I can't think of a better uh, person uh, to uh, give us our history of medicine talk about uh, the Civil War medicine and dentistry. Please give uh, our speaker a warm welcome. just like this. We very often get speakers from outside uh, Wisconsin, sometimes from outside the country. And they come there, they can't believe the beauty of the place. So you have a, a similar situation here. Anyway, I was sitting in an audience like this last night. Another group I belong to is called the uh, Metro Milwaukee Military Historians. About 120 people who came. And we were sitting there waiting for the speaker. That's always a problem, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, no speaker. So we get a call from the Highway Patrol. He was driving up from Indiana, and he was a Medal of Honor recipient. So we were going to listen to his story of receiving the Medal of Honor uh, in Vietnam. He's driving up from Indiana and he hit a deer. And his car went off the road and into a ditch. So I don't have, I, I don't have any further knowledge of his, uh, uh, what happened to him. Uh, hopefully he didn't get hurt. But uh, I didn't see any deer on the way over here tonight, so we're okay. <laughs> Now, a couple of years ago, I did a talk to a group similar to this after dinner. And the uh, program chairman came over to me and said, you know, they must have really liked you because only six of them fell asleep. <laughs> I still have not figured out if that's a compliment. <laughs> but I'll be watching you. Uh, but they were senior citizens, and I don't see any of those here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I brought uh, I brought some things. Some of you have had a chance to look at them, and uh, we'll discuss some of them as we go along. And uh, if we don't hit everyone, and you have questions, we can have a question answer period later. I will answer easy questions, sort of like the one that was posed to the Park Service guide at the end of a battlefield tour set his people down and said, are there any questions? And up from the back of the room comes a hand. says, yeah, I have a question. How come all these Civil War battles were fought in national parks? <laughs> Don't do that to me. OK, enough levity. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Civil War medicine mainly. I'd say Civil War dentistry is there. That's another story completely, but uh, we'll allude to that somewhat. I want to put a plug in if you, if you find this interesting. Uh, if you want to see a nice display, not just of medicine, but Civil War, go to the Kenosha Civil War Museum. Has anybody been there? Yeah, then you know what I'm talking about. It's a fairly new museum, $15 million museum. Beautifully done, beautiful uh, display of many things, including medical. Uh, another one, if you're ever in the area of Gettysburg, or Frederick, which is close to Gettysburg and Antietam, the National Civil War Medical Museum is there. Anybody seen that? Yeah? Okay. And then Madison has a Veterans Museum, and it's also a nice uh, display of medical uh, memorabilia. And yeah, that's the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Uh, let's see where my gadget is. Now what you're looking at there, uh, behind the title, is a hospital scene from Washington, D.C. Soldiers who were injured during the Civil War <coughs> usually went through three levels of, of care. Um, the first would be a field hospital or aid station near where the battles were, where they would be stabilized in any emergency surgery <coughs> done there. Then they would be moved to, uh, to a, field, a field hospital, a larger hospital, which would be probably a mile or two away from the battle away from where the uh, bullets were flying. And from there, they would go to a large general hospital. And this is a picture of, the, uh, of a ward in the, one of the larger general hospitals where they might go for rehabilitation. And uh, many of those would be in the large cities, like in Washington, D.C., or for the Confederates, it would be in Richmond. There were a few specialty hospitals actually was a maxillofacial hospital in Athens, Georgia. And there was also an eye hospital in Georgia, in the Confederacy, uh, encouraged and sanctioned by Jefferson Davis, who was then the president. And it is thought that my specialty of oral and maxillofacial surgery probably stemmed from the Civil War and the maxillofacial hospital. Um, by the end of the war, there were 400 hospitals. 400 hospitals. Well, they're not hospitals like you and I think of their hospitals today. They could have been in a barn, they could have been in someone's home. Anything that had a roof over it. were 400 hospitals and an uh, estimated 400,000 beds. The largest hospital is Chimborazo in Richmond, Virginia. It had a capacity of 7,000 patients. It had 150 wards. It had its own bakery that put out 10,000 loaves of bread a day. It had its own brewery, its own laundry. And over the course of the war, saw close to 80,000 patients. Nothing there now, just a historic marker. And at the start of the war, there were 100 physicians in the Army, 100. 
a fourth of those went south when the war was declared. So you had a very uh, inadequate and unprepared medical staff. But by the end of the war, there were 20,000 physicians, both north and south. 15,000 of them were military, and another 5,000 were contract, that were civilians who had been contracted to, to help out. 12,000 were Union, the rest were Confederate. And they had the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, statistics as far as mortality is concerned as the soldiers. Uh, over 300 died, most from disease, which is true also of the uh, most uh, of the men. Two thirds died from disease, mm -hmm. one third from <coughs> war injuries. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a couple of things I just added to my collection that I'm all excited about, you can tell, can't you? Uh, that I just had to put up front to show you. Now that is a form, it says, for examining a recruit. Hard to read. I don't know if you can, can you? No, it's not very good. It is like a history and physical type checklist that the recruiting surgeon would have used uh, before a soldier was admitted to active duty. Some of the questions. Have you ever been sick? Do you have a disease now? Have you ever had the fits? Have you ever had an injury or wound upon the head? Do uh, you have a habit of drinking? Do you have difficulty in urinating? Have you ever had the horrors? Whatever that is. <laughs> uh, have you been vaccinated? Yes, they had smallpox vaccinations, many of them. Uh, anyway, we won't spend a lot of time on that. Here's another very interesting form. It's the very first one I've ever come across. It's a draft form. This individual from Wisconsin, actually from and the cross area was drafted. You are hereby notified that you are on the 26th day of September 1864, legally drafted into the service of the United States for a period of one year. Blah, blah, blah. The place for rendezvous being La Crosse. Or be deemed a deserter and be subject to the penalty prescribed, therefore, by the rules and articles of war. See, when the uh, initial call for volunteers kind of fizzled out. Uh, Lincoln called for hundreds of thousands of men to be drafted. Now, there's another certificate that went along with that. And he was deferred because of a medical situation, a medical problem. He is not properly subject to do military duty as required, he is exempt from all liability to military duty for the present draft by reason of coxalgia. <laughs> now, I don't know, but does that mean he was a pain in the ass? <laughs> I really am not too sure about that. You know, if you just turn off the lights, can I have them back a little bit? I don't think we need them off. And I uh, have a cheat sheet here that I have to refer to from time to time. My memory is not what it used to be. Um, okay. Now this is an old slide, but I left it in. You have to add three zeros on top of everything. The reason I left it in oh maybe you can't even see that is that not on the screen yeah move it over just a little bit yeah there you go um, 617,000 deaths total Union and Confederate 617 that's a number that's been used for years and years 
Well, just very recently, been updated to 750,000. 750,000. So I wanted you to see that, but also what's important here is union enlistments. Almost 3 million. Confederacy, about half of that. Do you remember the show, uh, uh, Ken Burns' show on TV on the Civil War? And uh, one of the commentators was Shelby Foote. Does that ring a bell? That's right. Yep. Shelby Foote said the Union fought the Civil War with one hand tied behind its back. Mm. It tells you that right there. It almost tells you from the beginning they didn't have a, have a prayer, although the first couple of years they did pretty well. And there will be other things I will point out about the Union fighting with one hand behind its back. Okay. Um, the worst enemy of the soldier was disease. As I said, about two-thirds died from disease, one-third from battlefield injuries. Many of them didn't make it past their training camps. They were infected, they were diseased, and they never made it, they never made it on the battlefield. What caused many of the diseases, or most of the diseases? Well, this is one possibility. This is, no. This is uh, heart attack. You've all heard that. Mm -hmm. Flower water, that's basically a basic, um, a basic uh, staple for soldiers on the march and in the battlefield. Most of the illnesses came from poor food, poor hygiene, contaminated food and water, and crowding conditions. Lots of men coming from rural areas all of a sudden packed into uh, densely populated camps. They were supposed to take one bath a week, whether they needed it or not. <laughs> General Robert E. Lee said about his troops, they are worse than children at keeping clean, for the latter can be forced. <laughs> it was also said that a Civil War army could be smelled long before it could be seen. <laughs> uh, the problem with getting one bath a week, uh, of course, was you had to be near a stream. You had to be somewhere where there was water, running water. Uh, and that only worked in the summer. In the winter, when the streams were frozen, so they didn't have good hygiene, good cleanly, uh, cleanliness habits. The single most, <coughs> single most prevalent cause of death were uh, diarrhea and dysentery, and the complications thereof. A leading Confederate physician said, no Confederate soldier had a fully formed stool during the entire course of the war. <laughs> that could be unpleasant. The second leading cause of death was typhoid fever, followed by typhus. Other problems were malaria, yellow fever, chicken pox, whooping cough, pneumonia. And, and even smallpox, even though many of them were vaccinated, but a lot of the soldiers refused vaccination. Union physicians treated close to 200,000 cases of venereal disease as well. A third of the men who later went into veterans' homes died of late-stage venereal disease. That doesn't say anything about the disease they carried home to their spouses and families. Okay, in 1860, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., a senior now, said before the Massachusetts Medical Society, if the whole of Materia Medica, that's in quotes, 
as now used could sink to the bottom of the sea, it would be all the better for mankind and all the worse for the fish. <laughs> so the pharmacopoeia of, in the early 1860s for physicians included dozens of medicinals. Many were commercial preparations, some were prepared by the physician himself. Many were based on folk medicine, and many were patent medicines, like that one. That's walking, they're still around, actually. Alcohol, 40%, 47%, opium, one-third of a grain to the ounce. It didn't do anything, but you sure felt okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure about it. Yeah. There's another one. Uh, this is Jane's alternative, but alcohol, 25%. Many of them claimed they were good for man or beast. <laughs> of all the medications that the uh, Civil War physician might carry with him, only six worked as intended. Six. Although, if you look on the table, you see a um, medical paneer, as it's called, and there are probably a couple dozen bottles in there. The six that worked were the narcotics, morphine, and opium for pain, the general anesthetics, and we'll say a little bit more about that later, chloroform and ether, the antiseptic bromine, which was used uh, to treat uh, gangrene, and the anti-malarial quinine. They even learned that quinine could be used prophylactically to prevent malaria. The problem with some of these things, mainly quinine, because it worked so well for malaria, they began to use it for everything else. They said it works for this, it probably works for that, it works for this, and it works for that. Um, However, the most commonly used medication, what do you think it was? Alcohol. They called it medicinal alcohol. During the, during the war, the United States government issued 600,000 gallons of medicinal whiskey. <laughs> the Confederate government estimated an annual need of 200,000 gallons of medicinal alcohol. That was early in the war. By 1865, as the war was drawing to a close, the Confederates were issuing 625,000 gallons per year. I guess they really thought that maybe that made things look better. <coughs> That's my favorite one. Uh, what does it say? It's a diuretic to the kidneys. So, in addition to the meds that we talked about that were used, that didn't do much of anything, the theory that goes back to the time of Hippocrates and Galen of bleeding and purging were still very much in the minds of Civil War medical people. Although, to be fair, it was gradually being phased out. But still, during the war, you saw many physicians who believed in bleeding and purging. Why? Because they did not know that microorganisms caused disease. That was still 10 to 12 years off in the future. I often think that if the Civil War had been fought 10 years later, many lives would have been saved. They thought that disease was caused by impurities in the air. They called them miasma, miasmas, or effluvia is another term that was used, effluvia. And that these somehow got into the system and caused the disease. So the way to cure disease was to get rid of those things. And how did they do that? Bleeding and purging. Using emetics, cathartics, diaphoretics. 
and bloodletting. This is a flame. There's one up here if you want to take a closer look at it. And all it is is a sharp knife, three, three bladed sharp knife used to incise a, a vessel uh, and to remove, remove blood. As you may or may not know, that George Washington died that way. Uh, Washington, after his presidency, got sick after riding a horse in inclement weather. His uh, physicians were called to his side. They, they prescribed bleeding. He got worse, they prescribed more bleeding. He got worse, they prescribed more bleeding. The next day, he was dead. Uh, no lawyers. <laughs> Nobody thought anything of it. That was state of the art. Now 40% of that. Pardon? He was blood about 40% yeah. of that. Yeah. Anyway, there were no groovers around. <laughs> anyway, these are some more fleems. Um, again, man or beast. This large one, uh, what was the most important live thing on the battlefield other than the soldiers? Or horses. And there was a veterinary corps. It was a veterinary court, and they took care of the horses the same way. These are fleeing sticks. There's one up there, and you can use your own imagination as to how you think they were used. They were used to pound the blade into the, usually into the extremity. Aren't you glad you're alive today? <laughs> This one's a little bit more sophisticated. Was they did have some spring-activated uh, fleems, and there's a couple of them up on the table here that you can uh, get a closer look at. Oh, leeches. There's also one up here if you want to look at that. It's dead. But they did use leeches, and those are made a comeback, as you may know, into the medical fields today. But they did use them. Um, okay, so disease was the number one killer. Number two were these, these projectiles known to the soldiers as mini balls. At least the uh, conical ones were mini balls, not the round ones. The conical ones were mini balls. Anybody know why? Many invincible. Yes, who said that? You'll win. But I don't have a prize. <laughs> you can have my dessert. <laughs> we didn't hear what he said. He said Claude Minier, a French infantry man and inventor is the one who figured out that if a ball was conical rather than spherical and was fired from a rifle musket rather than a smooth bore it would go a lot further and it would be much more accurate and then and in fact that is the case a a uh, round ball fired from a Smooth bore musket would be accurate to about 50 feet, uh, 50 yards. I'm sorry. The uh, mini ball, 500. Yeah, it came in all different sizes and shapes, and here's what they look like once they hit something. Um, and they were fired by more than often than not a Springfield rifled musket. And there's one up on the table. You can get a closer look at it. These are reenactors. Just with gunpowder, or was there a casing, or? No, just gunpowder. In fact, you're really at him. What's this guy doing? Fighting. Uh, yeah, I forgot to, I forgot to ask the question I was going to ask. What are, what are the two most common, what were the two most prevalent reasons or deferment from military uh, action, from mili uh, participating in the military at that time. 
Someone got the first one. Who got it? Raise your hand. I'm proud of you. What was it? Hernia. Okay, hernia. Civil War surgeon would exempt you. And I have a bunch of exemptions up here for you to look at, too. And the one I'm... No teeth. <laughs> you can have half my dessert. <laughs> no teeth. So what's he doing? He's biting the end of a paper cartridge. The cartridges were paper. And you, it took nine steps to fire, to load and fire a, a Civil War uh, musket. So, and one of the first steps is, and there is a paper cartridge up here if you want to take a look at it. The paper cartridge contained the powder and the ball. First thing you had to do was open up the paper cartridge and that was done with the teeth. So he couldn't very well do it with his hands because in the other hand he had to hold his weapon. So if the examining surgeon saw that you had no front teeth to do this with, you were out. And they put you in a separate category called 4F. 4F. No fun for four front teeth. <laughs> now that, and I think as far as I know it's still in use today. It started with the teeth, but then gradually any other disability that would keep you off the battlefield came under the classification of 4F. Um, okay. There it is. Unfit for military duty by reason of loss of teeth in an upper jaw. It's a uh, deferment or exemption certificate. So that was number two. Number one was her name. Now, what do you think happened as the war wore on? A lot of these guys signed up for 90 days or a year. Mm. Suddenly they found themselves in a war, a protracted war that was going to last four years. They started getting letters from home, please come home. We can't afford to keep the farm going. What do you think happened? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's called malingering. <laughs> They either shoot themselves in the foot or the hand or do something. And uh, this was one of the ways to at least try to get out of military service. Now the War Department caught hold of that and they sent out a circular to the commanders in the field that said, if you find that your men are doing that, we'll just transfer them to the cavalry. The cavalry used breech loading weapons. And there's one up here that you can take a look at. Uh, in fact, I'm going to walk over there and show it to you. Because I don't have it on the board. This is a Maynard. There were many of them. Many different breech loading weapons. You might wonder, what has this got to do with medicine? Well, we'll get to that. This is a Maynard. Very simple. Cartridge goes in here instead of in here. And a, a metal cartridge on top of it, no paper cartridge, didn't need your teeth. Very short, easy to carry if you're on horseback, right? Uh, why is it called a Maynard? Because it was invented by Edward Maynard, who's a dentist. <laughs> Who had a practice on Pennsylvania Avenue and most likely had Jefferson Davis as a patient before the war. Mm -hmm. This was invented in 1850. When did the war start? So why didn't they arm all the guys with these? They could have had firepower that was far above what you could do with a muzzle-loading weapon. Why do you think? Cost too much. Cost too much. They would use too much ammunition. <laughs> And although you could make one of these for about nine dollars, this cost maybe fifteen. So the War Department was concerned about finances. 
although I got, I got to believe that if they had armed their soldiers with breech-loading weapons like that, or a Burnside or a Spencer or a Sharps, the war would have ended much sooner. Because the Confederates really didn't have access to those unless they picked them off the dead bodies on the battlefield. Mini ball was your second worst enemy, but the artillery, artillery was number three, and the uh, artillery shells came in all sizes and shapes as well. This is an example of two of them. Some of them were <coughs> solid, some of them exploded. I have one, a half of one, on the table. If we cut in half, and you can look inside. And you'll see that it's loaded with other small missiles. Mm -hmm. There would be a uh, there would be a a fuse up here that the gunner could set for one second, two seconds, three seconds, and it would blow open over the enemy troops and shower them with the smaller missiles. They were fired by guns like this. This is a the workhorse of the Civil War was a 12-pound Napoleon, not named after Napoleon the first, named after Napoleon the third. Um, but I'd tell you that you know the the science of mass destruction had already reached quite a pinnacle, but the science of healing. <coughs> really had not kept up with that. We talked about some of that already. These are small compared to what was available. You know what the size of the guns on the uh, Missouri and the Iowa class uh, battleships during the Second World War was? Anybody know? There were 16 inch guns. The uh, Union had, and I don't have it up here, but there's a picture of it down here, had a 20 inch gun. 20-inch gun that could fire a 1,000-pound shell five miles. So there's another example of the Union fighting the war with one hand tied behind its back because they never found that they had to use it. They built several of them. But had they gotten to the point where they would have had to use it, again, one hand tied behind their back. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's a blurred slide, but I have the real McCoy up here, and that's a bayonet. You know, you go to the movies and you see uh, bayonet charges and sword play and all that. Hardly ever happened during the Civil War. And the injuries were less than one percent from bayonets and 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 edged weapons. Um, why was that? Because you really never could get close enough to the enemy when you now had weapons that could kill at a thousand yards, or that were accurate to five hundred yards. You just couldn't get there. Uh, so there was it was it was extremely rare. Okay. The North and South listed over 50,000 amputations, and that was the treatment of choice when a mini ball did this to you. There's the ball, compound fracture of a femur. Most Injuries were to the extremities. Injuries to the chest, abdomen, and head, for the most part, weren't even treated. They were given morphine, put up below it in the shade in a tree, and said, well, good luck. But injuries to extremities could be uh, very survivable, especially 
if the amputation was done within 24 hours. And why was that? Because it prevented gangrene and septicemia and infection from spreading to the rest of the body. You could do it within 24 hours. The survival rate was about 75%. Pretty high for that time. This is from the Army uh, Medical Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, the Surgeon General at the time was encouraging physicians in the field to send specimens back <coughs> to the museum for study. And that's where this is. And there's still drawers and drawers full of specimens there today. A surgical kit that was carried by most surgeons either issued by the government or some of them had their own. This is one example, there's another example on the table. Um, what's wrong with this picture? Surgery. What's right with this picture? Um, what's he doing? Yes. You think he uh, scrubbed? <laughs> I think so. They had no idea that what they were doing was not aseptic or even clean. Here's another one. Anesthetic. All the stand bystanders in their street clothes. This is what, uh, this is an actual photograph of what you might have seen behind a field hospital uh, after a day's worth of amputations. Most amputations were the fingers. Next was the upper arm, mid thigh, and, and next to that, the lower leg. Why do you think upper arm was so, high, was so heavy? Backfires? Think about how, how you hold it on. Right? Like this, and hit here. Yeah, so you were partially correct. And the boys would wind up like this. If you look real close, there's a, there's a nurse there. If you've been to the Kenosha Museum, or if you're going, this, actually, this, this very famous picture actually has been reproduced life in a life-size diorama with life-size individuals. Um, this also was now the start of the prosthetic limb business that went big time during the Civil War. United States government would give soldiers who lost an arm fifty dollars uh, every five years to replace their loss with a prosthetic limb. And there were lots of patents on prosthetic limbs. Uh, people were fighting each other to get government contracts so they could get the fifty dollars. Leg, seventy-five dollars. Now I have a piece here that really doesn't look like any of the prosthetic limbs that I've seen. My guess is that that's a homemade, homemade item because you didn't get the limb right away. And a lot of the guys, while they were waiting in line to get their government funded limb, did something like this. And a lot of the guys would just rather have the $50 or the $75. So they got it, whether they used it for a prosthetic limb or not. Mm. In the Union, the uh, federal government authorized those payments to them. And then they s it took a little bit longer in the Confederacy. And the states came, stepped up to the plate, and uh, provided um, prosthetic limbs to the soldiers. And there's a book up here that talks about the prosthetic limb program in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. 
This is Dan Sickles Lake. General Sickles lost a lake at uh, Gettysburg. And he sent it to the museum in Washington, D.C. And supposedly, <coughs> every year on the anniversary of his loss, he would come and visit it. <laughs> and you can still visit it. It's still in the uh, Army Medical Museum. And this is the type of uh, ball that took his leg. Well, this is kind of the way a lot of the soldiers saw their surgeons. And Carl Schurz from Wisconsin, a general, this is what he described, what he saw after the Battle of Gettysburg. There stood the surgeons, their sleeves rolled up to their elbows, their bare arms, as well as their linen aprons, smeared with blood, their knives not seldom held between their teeth, while they are helping a patient on and off the table. The surgeon snatched his knife from between his teeth, wiped it rapidly once or twice across his blood-stained apron, and the cutting began. Sounds brutal, but they saved many lives by doing that. A lot of lives were saved by doing that, with the conditions that they thought were appropriate. Okay, this is where I'm probably going to get into trouble with the anesthesiologists in the group. How many of them are there? Oh, do I have to leave? Michelle, <laughs> you're looking at me. Okay. Uh, dentistry's answer to the humiliating spectrum. Dr. John Hunter, 18th century scientist and surgeon, described a surgeon as a savage armed with a knife <laughs> and surgery as the humiliating spectacle of the futility of science. Why? Well, before I get into that, this is perhaps the myth of the bite the bullet. Uh, there are some mini balls that seem to show indentations of teeth. Is there some validity to that? I don't know. Maybe. We did some experiments at the dental school to see if a uh, human being could do that. Well, the mini ball was very soft, soft lead. And yes, it is possible to do that. However, if you look at that, there's a zillion indentations on each one of those. Conventional wisdom says today that how that happened was that many of the shallow graves were dug up by wild boars and other animals uh, feeding on the cadavers, and they would, in turn, uh, make these uh, indentations in the, in the uh, lead balls which seems more likely. It seems more likely because there were anesthetics during the Civil War. Anesthetics came about probably 1840, 1842, uh, 1846 with ether. We'll just talk about that for a minute. Um, and statistics show, union records show, that over 80,000 cases of general anesthetics were used in the Union. And the surviving records, and many records for the Confederacy, were burned at the end of the war when Richmond burned. At least those that, that survived show that there were 30,000 general anesthetics in use. And they were plentiful. They were not hard to make. There were factories that made these. And you, you, you say, well, what about the Confederates? Well, the Confederates made some, and there was an active trade between the lines. And there's a new book I just, call, I just got called Trading with the Enemy. And it talks about that, the black markets, the trading between the lines, uh, and, uh, and the 
blockade runners that brought medical supplies and armaments from Europe to the Confederacy. So the Confederacy most always had, most always had the stuff they needed, the items they needed. Okay, here's where I probably will get in trouble. Dr. Horace Wells, DDS, the father of anesthesia. Now there were, yes, I know, there were several claimants to that title. Why? Because Congress offered a $100,000 prize to anyone who could come up with something that would work as an anesthetic. So, of course, everybody wanted to get the $100,000. Make a long story short, nobody ever got it. But there were four major claimants to that title. However, in my research, and I did a lot of research on this, when the sesquicentennial of the discovery of anesthesia came about in the early 90s, both the American Medical Association and the American Dental Association, through resolution, declared Horace Wells the discoverer of anesthesia. End of story. <laughs> so, there. <laughs> uh, oh, what did I do now? Must have hit the wrong button. You know, I still like slides. <laughs> I've given three, three programs in the last three weeks. Thank you. And there is an issue with every one of them. An issue with every one of them. Computer, something was always a problem. Projector, always something. Anyway, today we've been doing pretty good up to right now. 1700s. Priestley, you probably all remember him from our chemistry courses in high school, uh, discovered oxygen, but also nitrous oxide. And that's how it's made. Not hard. Not hard to do. Uh, and before the advent of anesthetics, this is how surgery was performed. Your surgical assistants were people that held you down by your arms and legs. And the surgeon, if he was a good surgeon, would be able to take a leg off in probably about 30 seconds. They didn't venture into the body cavities at all. It was almost all extremities. So you can see here. Uh, so uh, nitrous oxide and some of the other inhalation agents, like ether, we'll talk about in a minute, uh, could be purchased across the counter, just about anywhere. And they were used pretty much like recreational drugs are used today. This was known as a ether frolic. <laughs> well, Horace went to one of these things where they were demonstrating nitrous oxide with a friend of his. And as the story goes, and it's documented, uh, his friend, under the influence of nitrous oxide, became euphoric, which we all know it's called also laughing gas, so there's a euphoric element to it. He fell, he injured his leg, and complained of no discomfort, didn't even remember that he had done that. So Horace, looking at this, a practicing, he's a practicing dentist in Hartford, Connecticut, who up until this point goes into his office every single day and does dental surgery without anesthetics. Great day, huh? <laughs> nice to wake up in the morning and say, well, I can hardly wait to get to the office. <laughs> so he was looking for a better solution. And the next day after he was Observe, after he had observed this, he had his partner remove one of his teeth after he had inhaled nitrous oxide. And he had no recollection, he said, and didn't feel any discomfort. Um, well, 
I don't know, there are a few of us here who have worked with nitrous oxide, and we know that it's not a very potent anesthetic by itself. Uh, it's still used in my profession as a sedative, and it works very well as a sedative, but it has a small amount of analgesic effect. And he probably could have got away with this if it was a minor procedure. So he tried to demonstrate this at Massachusetts General Hospital, and it didn't go well. Even though the patient said there was no recollection and no discomfort, the patient still uh, ex uh, yelled, to put it mildly, and uh, it didn't go well. So, Horace Wells was an apprentice trained dentist, as many medical people were too. Most of the uh, uh, physicians who served in the Civil War uh, were apprentice trained. Some had medical degrees, some did not. And to get a medical degree was not that difficult. You went and listened to a year's full of lectures. And if you liked the lectures, you could come back a second year and listen to the same lectures. You've got no clinical experience whatsoever, unless you decided after you got done with your lecture series that you would apprentice with someone who was doing clinical medicine. So there was a wide variety of training experiences uh, for physicians as well as for dentists. Um, the first dental school opened in 1840, Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, and there weren't many, and they didn't take many uh, uh, applicants. It was small, not compared, not, nothing compared to where they are today. So Wells had been an apprentice-trained dentist, and he had an apprentice, William Morton. Morton saw what Wells was doing with inhalation anesthesia, and he also saw that nitrous oxide uh, was okay for some things, but certainly not if you wanted to do invasive surgery or anything beyond uh, the simplest procedures. So he decides he's going to see if he can do something better. <clears throat> and uh, one of his professors, who is also one of the claimants to the uh, uh, discovery of dentistry, Dr. Charles Jackson, who was a professor at uh, Harvard Medical School, uh, who claims that he was the discoverer of anesthesia, but he also claimed he was the discoverer of the Morse code. Um, so, but Ch Jackson said to Morton, why don't you try ether? Experimented on his wife, experimented on his kids, experimented on his dog. In that order? Probably not in that order. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then started to use it in practice, and when he, when he was pretty sure that this was something that might have a future, and by now he was a medical student at Harvard, he got his, uh, he pulled some strings and got the chief of surgery, Dr. John Collins Warren, right here, uh, to do a procedure under ether anesthesia. This is Morton right here. This is a picture of the second general anesthetic given at Massachusetts General, at Massachusetts general Hospital. The first one was given the day before, but they didn't have a photographer. So here, the, the uh, uh, John Collins weren't about to do an amputation. And so what's wrong with this picture? Straight close. Here we go again. This is about 1847, maybe. Yeah, about 1847. I've been a little earlier. It worked great. The uh, exclamation from Dr. Warren was, and you probably heard this, gentlemen, this is no humbug. Mm -hmm. So here we have John Y. Simpson, a Scottish obstetrician, who a year later was working with chloroform. He was working with chloroform. Also, probably not that hard to make. But he got a lot of trouble, got in a lot of trouble with the churches. 
the church has said to him, cease and desist because the pain of childbirth is God's will. And you're interfering with God's will. Well, Queen Victoria was on her eighth delivery and she said, give me the gas, doctor. <laughs> Here she has five of her kids already. And uh, her next two kids were with chloroform anesthesia and uh, that went around the world. And I'd say that's probably the beginning of the of worldwide use of, of general anesthesia. Yeah, as I alluded to before, uh, anesthetics were available through well, across the line um, trading. And one of the ways they did it, if they wanted to conceal what they were doing, they would hide them in baby carriages or dolls like this. Um, contraband to, uh, to fool the uh, people at the border. Just a couple of words about nursing. There's some prominent people who were nurses that you might not expect. Nursing really came about as a profession during the Civil War. The Civil War nurse Prior to the Civil War, nurses were uh, very often women from religious orders or men. It was not considered fitting for a young woman. Until this lady came along, this is Dorothea Dix, you have heard that name before. Mm -hmm. She, with the encouragement of the War Department and Abraham Lincoln, formed a nurses' corps. She eventually hired some 3,000 nurses. She was using as her guide the uh, work done by Florence Nightingale and during the Crimean War in the 1850s uh, in Crimea. And she actually had some contact with Florence Nightingale. So she hired like 3,000 nurses. She had very strict guidelines. They had to be between 35 and 50. She couldn't wear any jewelry, no cosmetics, uh, no hoop skirts, and they couldn't look over anxious. <laughs> In other words, they were supposed to look like her. <laughs> but thanks to her, we had a nursing school. This is Clara Barton, also a name out of our history books. She was a nurse, and she also was involved with the Sanitary Commission. I didn't say too much about that. The Sanitary Commission was a forerunner of the Red Cross, and she was the founder of the American Red Cross. She was the first nurse to actually go on the battlefield with bandages and medical supplies, and she treated soldiers from both sides. At the end of the war, uh, she compiled the records of those missing in action and many of whom were buried in hastily uh, constructed graves. I just had the grand opening. Oh, there she is as a young child. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who's that? Louisa May Alcott. She wrote what? And she also wrote a nice book called Hospital Sketches. She was a nurse in the uh, general hospitals around Washington, D.C. And she wrote extensively about her experiences. Dr. Dr. Mary Walker, ever hear of her? The only woman to this day to receive the Medal of Honor. She was an early graduate of a medical school in uh, New York. But because, and she tried to enlist as a surgeon in the Army, but because she was a female, they wouldn't allow it. And uh, as such, she became a nurse, even though she had a medical degree. 
and she started uh, again to treat patients between the lines, north and south. Eventually she was recognized for her efforts, and she was commissioned in the United States Army, and uh, toward the end of the war she was given her Medal of Honor. To this day, the only one. Now, at the end of the war, there was a committee to review the conduct of the war, and one of the things they discussed was the granting of the Medal of Honor. Well, the Medal of Honor was given out uh, some 12, 1,300 times during the Civil War. Why was that? Well, they didn't have any other medals. There were no Silver Stars or all the others. Uh, so, in effect, they would give them to entire units rather than just if an individual. So the committee decides, well, maybe we just went a little overboard and we did this too frivolously. And they uh, retracted 900 of them. <laughs> One of them was hers. And she said, screw you, I'm not giving it back. <laughs> and she wore it every day till the day she died, and she took it with her to her grave. Uh, in 1982, Jimmy Carter gave it back to her. And at that time, this commemorative stamp came out at the same time, so she got her medal back. Walt Whitman, he was a nurse in the um, general hospitals in Washington, D.C. He tried to enlist, but he was already in his 50s, and they wouldn't let him enlist in the military. So he had a brother, a younger brother, who was injured in the war and was in one of the hospitals, he went to visit his younger brother, and he saw the sufferings in the hospital, and he said, well, I'm going to do what I can do. He used his whatever savings he had and uh, bought uh, necessities for the soldiers, and wrote home letters to their wives or their, their, uh, their survivors, and did what he could. And he also wrote extensively about his efforts <laughs> in a book called The Wound Dresser. And he also included some of his experiences in the poetry he wrote as well. Lewis Harvey, we're almost at the end here now. <laughs> Lewis Harvey, he was the second governor of Wisconsin during the Civil War. We had four governors during the Civil War. The most of any state, north or south. One of the reasons was Lewis Harvey. He was only governor for three months. Lewis Harvey was very concerned about his soldiers down south around the Battle of Shiloh when he was taking care packages, medical supplies, what have you, to Shiloh. When he stepped off a boat, fell into the Tennessee River and drowned. Mm -hmm. He didn't find his body for days afterwards. But then his wife, who was in mourning, Cordelia Hardy took up the torch, so to speak, and this is a picture of her that hangs in the state capitol building. She became an agent of the Sanitary Commission, which I really didn't explain very well, but the Sanitary Commission was a volunteer organization made up mo mostly of, of women who were auxiliaries in many ways to the Army Medical Corps. And she took up his torch and uh, went and, and uh, ministered to the soldiers in the South. But she did one other very important thing. She felt that if she could get the wounded soldiers out of the miasmatic air of the South and brought them north where the air was clean, that they would heal better. Mm -hmm. So she went to visit Abraham Lincoln. And she made the case that you got to let these soldiers come to a healthier climate. And he said, well, if we do that, once they get well, they'll never come back. And she said, well, you know, if they don't get well, they definitely aren't coming back. <laughs> so she convinced him. And he put up the money for a number of hospitals. Three of them were here in the state. One of them in Madison, one of them here. The other one was in the Prairie du Chien area. And although nobody has said this, 
I do believe that she probably was like a founder of the VA system to some degree. She was named the of the angel, the Wisconsin's angel of the battlefield. All right, this is my last slide, which you probably can't read because I had to take it through some thick glass. But I think you need to hear this. It was written up in a medical journal. During the Battle of Raymond, Mississippi, in I think, what does that say, June maybe? A mini ball reportedly passed through the reproductive organs of a young rebel soldier and a few seconds later penetrated a young lady who was standing on the porch of her nearby home. The story was written 11 years later by Dr. Legrand G. Capers of Vicksburg for the American Medical Weekly. Capers claimed that he tended the wounds, <laughs> that the girl became pregnant from the fertile mini ball, <laughs> that he delivered the baby, introduced her to the soldier, that the two were married, and had two more children in the conventional way. <laughs> Believe it or not. Invention of IVF. Huh? The invention of IVF. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. I want to uh, questions. Remember, when doctors killed off with their wrong way of dealing with things? You know, I've never seen a number, but definitely there were substantial numbers. Uh, I didn't mention that one of the drugs they liked to use was calomel. Calomel is mercury. Mm -hmm. They use it for everything. And mercury, as we know, is a poison. So I'm sure that they killed off some with the use of mercury and some other things. But anesthetic-wise, there are some records, and you would think using chloroform and ether that maybe, maybe, they would have had a lot of anesthetic deaths, but hardly any. Why? Number one, the procedures were short. Number two, you had very healthy patients, right? They were young, no problem. Number three, they were out in the open, and fresh air mixing in with the, with the anesthetic. Uh, so to answer your question, I have no idea. But we do know that many of them survived. Yeah. Erastus Walcott. Yeah. Well, we have a Walcott in here. Is that you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a whole different spelling. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We talked about that earlier. Mm -hmm. He was oh, Surgeon General of Wisconsin. Well, he's Surgeon General of Wisconsin, but not of the. No. Oh. Well, you, okay. Surgeon Generals were, were uh, Hammond and Barnes. And Hammond got kicked out because he said no more use of calomel and mercury. It was dangerous. But the powers that be who wanted him out anyway uh, said you can't do that. And they uh, kicked him out and, uh, and uh, Dr. Barnes became the Surgeon General. There were three third Surgeon Generals. I think the first one was Finley. But yeah, Walker was Wisconsin. I don't know how many states had a surgeon general. The fact that all my readings, the only one I've come across is Walcott. Well, he supposedly did the first nephrectomy, but was that in the, in, was that on the soldier, or was that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. I think that was, uh, I, he, he really never was, uh, he, he was a civilian the whole time, as far as I know. He was not a commissioned officer, even though he had the title of surgeon general. That's it. Everybody remember to come in January and also to go to the new location at the Wisconsin Club. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.